the MMC for a present for uh, for a presentation. I think the government. So there's they're keeping it there. We haven't heard any news about its next uh, venture into the shop to repair the prime mover. Uh, prime mover change outs are not that big a deal, so I wouldn't. I wouldn't. Uh, I wouldn't say the engine is no longer in service. It's just they, they got a budget for it. And uh, pardon my outfit here. I'm still at work, but uh, I have to wear this fireproof stuff. All right, we're uh, we're live here streaming. So whenever uh, Mike, whenever you're ready to turn it over to uh, Tom I'm Reynolds, ready. feel free. Ready anytime. So okay, close. great. So uh, let me uh, share my screen first, and then I will start my PowerPoint. So uh, since I can't see what you guys can see, hang on for a second here. Okay, so do you guys see my PowerPoint? Yeah, it looks good, Tom. Okay, good, great. So good evening, my name is Tom Reynolds. I'm president of the Raritan River Railroad Historical Society. And tonight we're gonna to talk about New Jersey's most famous short line, at least from the movie side, the Raritan River Railroad. Now the Raritan River Railroad was small. They were only 12 miles long from South Amboy to New Brunswick but they were one of the most profitable per mile of track in New Jersey. They paid amazing dividends on their stock and they faithfully served the towns and industries on the, in central Jersey, even fighting off Conrail for almost four years until eventually they did get assimilated into the Conrail system in 1980. So tonight we're gonna to talk about a story of the Raritan River Railroad from its humble beginnings in the 1880s through its battles with the trolley line in the 90s, expansion and prosperity in the zero zero, concluding with its debut in the silent movies of the teens. Uh, unfortunately, uh, that will take me two hours. <laughs> as much as I would love to talk about the whole Raritan River Railroad, I probably need another, uh, another session. So sit back and enjoy your story, a story you may have never heard before about New Jersey's most film famous railroad. So our story starts, it has its roots in the line that was contemplated in 1881, which was fully backed with stock being sold to some of the big names in the New Brunswick area, men like Janeway and Carpenter who owned a big wallpaper factory in New Brunswick, but there were probably dozens of others. It was reported that this deal only fell through from the joint action of the Pennsylvania Railroad Company and the Central Railroad of New Jersey, touching the New York and Long Branch Railroad. And ultimately, the, the reason that they said that is that uh, it was thought not to be sensible by the receiver of the Central Railroad, which was bankrupt at that point, to do anything at that juncture which would jeopardize the relations of the two roads. And that was because in January of 1882, there was an agreement that split the New York and Long Branch property between the CNJ and the Pennsylvania Railroad with trackage rights for both. And a line from the CNJ in Boundbrook to the New York and Long Branch in South Amboy would have upset that balance between the partnership between the PRR and the CNJ. So here we see a map from about 1884. Um, the green lines from the west up here is the central uh, Jersey uh, coming out of uh, the Pennsylvania coal mines. Uh, we see the Lehigh Valley in red also coming from Pennsylvania. Uh, the green coming up here is the uh, redding. Uh, and the green and uh, the black and green over here is the New York and Long Branch, which was shared by the PRR, which is in black, and obviously the central. You know, to put this all together, the Lehigh Valley built this extension to Perth Amboy on tidewater of the Raritan Bay in 1875. And just two years after that, the Redding got connected to Boundbrook in 1879 when they came up out of Pennsylvania. So it's no surprise that you hear that in 1881, they were trying to conceive of a railroad to go from Boundbrook to South Amboy. And again, just due to that Pennsylvania Railroad agreement, that concept stalled for a while. So by 1887, since no major railroad was gonna back anything, Sidney Ripley from Massachusetts decides to get rights and title to build the line himself with his own funding and you know selling stock and whatnot. And he was gonna build his own line from Boundbrook to South Amboy, which would eventually get incorporated in April of 1888 as the Raritan River Railroad. But in a twist, the line would start in South Amboy instead of Boundbrook. Now they always had intentions of connecting with the central Jersey and Boundbrook, um, 
that, that was in their prospectus and it was in their official reports. Uh, and I think that they were going to wait to get to Boundbrook before they uh, had to, you know, formalize that deal. So on the eastern side of the line from South Amboy heading towards South River, the line would start, uh, uh, would get a lot of support very quickly from the local landowners in the area, many who would become customers very quickly once the line was built. Progress was quick on the Raritan River Railroad, as in the fall of 1888, we can see that uh, we have the switch in place with the New York and Long Branch connection, but the bridge over Deep Cut is not finished yet. For all of our Pennsylvania Railroad fans, they should be uh, well aware that Deep Cut was a very deep uh, uh, grade that was lowered uh, just west of uh, South Amboy. Uh, and the Raritan River Railroad was going to need to build up their own grade as well as putting a bridge in place to do that. The line also extended from Suches. Suches happened to be a, uh, a landowner in the, uh, uh, in, the, in the Sayreville area with uh, sand and clay pits, but he also had a connection, a long spur off of the Pennsylvania Railroad. So the Raritan River worked with him to bring in construction supplies and to put in a switch. And they started working east towards South uh, Amboy and west towards South River at the same time. So they were really working on three, you know, fronts at the same time. So they were making pretty good progress. Um, also, it was noted by the fall of 1888 that grading had started in Tanner's Corner leading up to Milltown. Uh, small spurs would be built very quickly uh, to some of these customers that were listed, like Crossman's and Suches and Edgar's. And for the most part, they were all sand and uh, clay type operations. In February of 1889, it was reported in the Monthly Traveler's official railway guide that the Raritan River Railroad was officially open for business for through freight. As the line was still under construction, it was only open for freight service from South River, Sayreville. It lists Edgar's and Suches and many of the names that I've just said. Um, and basically, they were only open for a distance of eight miles. And even then, South River didn't have any stations yet. There was no official station in South Amboy. Um, so let's talk a little bit about who these customers were and why they were so important. Um, Edgar's uh, was one of the larger landowners in the area. He owned a lot of property all around. Uh, and essentially, he was a sand and clay operation uh, where they would uh, process sand and make bricks. Um, uh, and, and it was an extensive process that basically was in use from basically South Amboy all the way up into Milltown and big parts of uh, New Jersey. Um, here's another photograph of um, an area in Sayreville, uh, and it highlights the sand and clay. That big mountain in the background would eventually get completely removed uh, and carted away. Uh, and eventually today there's all houses up there. Uh, and it's not up there. It's actually at grade with the, the railroad. But this is a great photograph because it shows one of the workers and it was a very manual task. You know, they basically loaded the sand and the clay in these special hopper cars. Now this was not a Raritan River track. In many ways, this was a narrow gauge or in sometimes a broad gauge. They had special cars for this kind of stuff, but it was manually backbreaking work. This guy shoveled this car, he filled it, and eventually a, a steam dinky would come along and cart it to the processing plant. Um, in a lot of ways, this was a spring, summer, and fall operation. In the winter time, when the ground froze, a lot of these uh, sand uh, and clay workers uh, would go down to Chesapeake Bay where they would uh, gather oysters for a couple of months and then they would come back and wait for the plants to open up in the spring. The line was laid with 60 pound rail and in addition to its two locomotives and one passenger car, they now had 22 freight cars according to Poor's. Uh, in order to support the maintenance needs the two of the two locomotives and the coach being used, by the construction company. Uh, the railroad built a small blacksmith's shop as well as a car house in South Amboy. And that would be some of the first structures uh, that were being built uh, at the end of 1888 and early uh, 89. And they built that near Ferris Street and Broadway. The year 1889 would not open with the same degree of success that 1888 gave the Little Raritan River Railroad. After two days of storms in January 6th, 1889, the bridge that was under construction in Milltown was actually washed away in a major flood. 
While the bridge was not finished yet, the abutments had been started and the rafters had been laid, but the foundations had given way under the rush and the torrent and the whole structure fell into the river. They also had some issues just beyond the Lawrence Brook trestle, which is the one that we just said washed away. Because pretty early on, the landowners were uh, not interested in selling to the railroad. Um, they were uh, uh, fighting the, uh, the, the railroad coming through and a lot of these properties had to be condemned. Uh, it took a long time to condemn them. It, they went through the court case, they went through the courts uh, repeatedly. Um, but one of the things I noticed, which was really interesting, when you look at the family names of who owned the property, we see that Martha Borium, her property was condemned, but Maria Borium, a few, you know, a, a couple hundred yards away, her property was sold to the railroad. And you see the same thing with the Elkins family. Mary Elkins sold her property in September of 89, but John Elkins had his property condemned. And I make this joke, and it's probably very true, that Thanksgiving in Milltown in 1889 was probably quite contentious. <laughs> and even if it wasn't with these families, it was with all the people who knew these families. Um, so amazingly, it was announced in March that the first through train, this would be March of 80, 1889, it was announced that the first through train to New York was gonna be run on the line in April of 1889. Now, oddly, it was to leave Van Deventer's station, which was just east of South River and actually in Sayreville to participate in the centennial celebration. So just a year after the Raritan River Railroad Incorporated in April of 88, the first through passenger train left for New York in April of 89. The fact that the train left Van Deventer station though, makes me think that the bridge over the South River just wasn't ready yet, or there was just no facilities or the ability to get into the actual town of South River. The trip was a success as reported in the New York Times. And as April would end with a celebration, May, would open up with a riot and a murder. For on Saturday night, May 4th, 1889, the Raritan River Railroad tried to run a spur from their main line across the lands of Edward Furman to reach the lands of William Fisher, a rival brickyard owner, to give Fisher an outlet for his bricks, his fire clay, and other freight. The problem was the railroad did not have permission from Furman yet. The construction of the spur started in Sayreville, close to Van Deventer's stop near Journey, Journey's Mill Road, and was to proceed north to the lands of William Fisher. Furman reported that a couple of days before, the railroad served notice that the railroad contemplated in having his land condemned. So Furman was just waiting around, aware of the interest, and thought that he would wait for the court papers to arrive. But instead, the Raritan River Railroad, starting around midnight, made a run on his property. One of Furman's workers became aware and tried to stop the railroad men. Eventually, Furman's entire bunkhouse cleared out and started fighting with the railroad men. Hendrickson, who happened to be the passenger and freight agent, ran to get help from William Fisher. So he ran a mile or two up the road, who came down with dozens of more men and also started clashing with Fisher's men, who now started setting the railroad cars, the ties, and other supplies on fire. It turned into a full-fledged battle. By the morning, one man from the railroad was seriously hurt, and one man from Fisher's group, uh, from Furman's group, was actually dead. The sheriff in New Brunswick was called down and rushed down with over 100 deputies and later arrested the railroad freight agent, the Raritan River Railroad freight agent, Hendrickson, and Hussey, who was the, um, the boss man of the group, and charged them both with murder. Later on, the vice president of the Raritan River Railroad, Colonel, Colonel Hobart, would also get indicted by the grand jury as well as William Fisher himself. But in the end, the case for murder was never proven, but the civil case was, and so the Raritan River had to pay $6,000 to Furman, who then gave them the right to build on his land anyway, and then build a siding to his brick sheds. All in all, it was just another waste of time, money, and resources, which hampered the railroad's progress in getting to Mound Brook. By the end of August of 89, work on the railroad is slowly being nudged forwards towards completion. Workers are engaged in grading and laying track near George's Road in New Brunswick. Um, after, trying, after slowly getting past the condemnation problems uh, just west of Milltown, active tracks are laid only as far as South River, with regular trains running from South River to South Amboy, but that was just the way it was at the end of 1888. In fact, nothing has changed as far as active tracks go. 
So you can only imagine the report back to the, you know, the board of directors and the officers in Jersey City that in an entire year they've made no active progress in in uh, opening up more line. So in September, September 1889 opens more with bridge with more bridge issues in South River as Main Street, which had been closed for some time, is open again on September 6th, but the sidewalks were not graded right, and there was a four-foot drop on either side. And just 10 days later, on September 16th, 1889, the uh, adjacent bridge for the East Brunswick and New Brunswick Turnpike, which was just completed in July, collapsed in a heavy rainstorm when the abutments gave way. Sounds like a, a common theme here. So by this point, the bridge is built in Milltown, over here on the left, but it sits on the ground since a work train with a crane can't get to Milltown to lift it in place because the grading in South River is not done through Tanner's Corner. So to put this all in perspective, let's take a closer look at Tanner's Corner in South River and maybe we'll get an idea of what's going on here. This is a wonderful photo from the South River Historical Society. This is the main from the Main Street Bridge in South River showing the deep cut that needed to be dug out in Tanner's Corner to get from South River to Milltown. In the distance, you can see the Old Bridge, uh, the New Brunswick and Old Bridge Turnpike Bridge, which collapsed in September of 89, shortly after being built. This is also the cut that Nelson's men, Nelson was a contractor who had a whole bunch of men working underneath him, um, uh, where the Nelson's men were, you know, digging uh, manually for the most part, uh, as much as they could to try to lower this grade. Um, and they were doing that while they were getting paid because at some point Nelson stopped paying his men and they stopped working and then they sued him and the railroad for their back pay. So the sheriff comes along down from New Brunswick again, he confiscates all of Nelson's tools and Nelson had $6,000 steam shovel in his possession uh, at Tanner's Corner and the, auction, uh, the sheriff auctioned that off uh, to get the money to pay uh, the men. Now the railroad actually was the one that bought the steam shovel back and they only paid $150 for it. So they kind of made out in that deal. This is a small station, it's called Tanner's. We'll talk more about that in a minute. So since at least September of 88, up until January of 1890, several hundred men would toil relentlessly in this cut. There's plenty of newspaper articles where they kept getting people from New York, you know, 75 Italians and 35 of these groups. And they just kept throwing people at this cut. And it just seems like no matter what they did, uh, they just couldn't get it they just couldn't get it deep enough because they probably just kept collapsing on the sides because you can see that the sand uh, is, is uh, you know, is a serious issue. Um, so they're constantly trying to fight the elements, the weather and the soft sands that would wash away anything with a heavy rain. Sadly, it is this cut that also caused a significant amount of delay and increasing the costs in building the railroad as the work trains could never get past it, thus requiring all materials for the western part of the line to be brought in with horse or oxen or human labor. Again, more time, money and resources were being wasted uh, or washed away in this case. But finally, Finally, in January of 1890, the line is finally opened from South Amboy through South River to Milltown. Um, it's, this is a really, uh, this is, uh, uh, this was a great find as far as the timetable goes, because it really just shows the end of the line being at Milltown. Um, and they didn't, you know, they're still working towards New Brunswick. So the, in the spring, uh, of 1890, they're, they're moving slowly, uh, towards New Brunswick, uh, unfortunately, very slowly. Uh, in late June of 1890, the Raritan River Railroad petitions New Brunswick City Council for permission to build the first station in New Brunswick to accommodate the summer travel and to all points upon the New Jersey coast. This station was to be situated upon lands on uh, uh, up near Commercial Ave, um, near uh, Lawrence Street, and that station would finally get built. Um, New Brunswick would finally get reached and the first through trains from New Brunswick through Milltown, South River, uh, South Amboy would finally be run and connecting with the uh, New York and Long Branch to the Jersey Shore. And that would basically be July 4th of 1890. Some real news for December of 1892 was um, that the railroad announced that they would start commence running regular passenger trains into Sayreville this month over the recently completed Sayreville branch. 
Also in December of 1890, the Raritan River Railroad had secured accommodations for the sale of tickets in South Amboy at the office of the Adams Express Company, which was actually one of the buildings down here in the bottom. Um, surprisingly, uh, th this happened to be directly across the street from where they would eventually have their John Street office. Uh, so this is John Street in South, South Amboy. These are the New York and Long Branch tracks. They had an old turntable across the street at one point. Um, and this is where the Raritan River Railroad had their little, uh, had their, their office and their passenger station. So here we see the progress of the line with the little stations for stops being constructed in all the major areas. Some spurs and branch lines are now getting built as traffic and tonnage is quickly rising on the little line. I won't go through and name all the little stations, but basically every half mile or every mile or so, uh, there was a place for uh, people and workers to get off. By the end of 1891, the Raritan River Railroad had a number of spurs, sidings, and branches from their main line, and such as to uh, Such's Works, which was a half mile, Middlesex Works, which is about a tenth of a mile, Edgar's had a quarter mile, uh, Furman's Works, half mile, Willett's Works, a quarter mile, and from the Sayreville Junction to Sayreville, that was 2.3 uh, miles for a total of almost four miles of branch lines and spurs. In addition, a very long spur, almost a mile in length, was built in East Brunswick in 1891 to the sand and clay lands of Sayre and Fisher. On these tracks, local sand and clays would be brought in from East Brunswick back to Sayreville, where Sayre and Fisher would process them and turn them into bricks. In later years, these tracks would eventually get extended to become the service branch. We also note other sand and clay groups out here, like the American Enamel Brick and Tile Company, uh, which was in South River. And there's a little easement over here on somebody else's property so that they could get to the, to the branch line here and load up their hopper cars. So there was definitely a lot of interesting sand and clays with special properties that were in East Brunswick uh, that were then getting shipped to South River and Sayreville for processing. So in 1890, engine number three shows up. Uh, it gets quickly replaced in 1892 with a new in number three. Um, so in 1892, the Raritan River Railroad has their three engines. They have about two dozen or so freight cars, probably of the 20 ton gondola type. Uh, they have two or three passenger cars. Uh, 1892 is the year that the company officially takes over the line from the construction company. So officially the Raritan River Railroad is in business. Early of 1892, the Raritan River Railroad makes an announcement that they have abandoned the plan to get to Boundbrook. In all other newspaper articles, we note issues with the Pennsylvania Railroad's plan to elevate their main line as one of the reasons that the Raritan River Railroad just couldn't get across New Brunswick. In the end, though, I believe that there was just too many delays on the Raritan River and not enough money left over to make the final run through New Brunswick and then up into Boundbrook. At almost the same time, the Reading announced their desire to build their own line from Boundbrook to Tidewater, just above Perth Amboy to a spot that would later be known as Port Reading. The newspaper specifically reported that, quote unquote, this branch line was primarily intended to be used for getting coal to Tidewater without running over other roads. So I'm convinced that the Reading was kind of waiting for the Raritan River Railroad to get finished and get completed into Boundbrook, and then would have just leased them like many of the other lines of the time. But when it was clear due to the condemnation proceedings, the riot, all the court cases, the grading issues, when it became clear to the Reading that that was just never going to happen, they started putting their own surveyors out, and there's lots of them being noted in the newspapers, uh, because the surveyors never said who they were working for. You just could tell where the line was going to go. Um, and it was that point that the bound, that the Reading just decided to build their own line from, from Boundbrook to uh, Tidewater. Um, and that line would get finished in 1893. And this also explains maybe why there was such a stalling action in trying to get into New Brunswick. Because again, by the time they got through Milltown, it's almost like they couldn't figure out where they were going to go. And it's probably because they didn't know where they were going to go. Um, so the rest of the 1890s were spent building the stations and infrastructure, right, to commence operations on the line. Here we see the passenger and the freight station in South River in front of the Herman Aukman handkerchief factory, which was one of the uh, first customers on the line. This is the only picture I have of the first set of Milltown stations, which were built in uh, also in 1892. 
Milltown was uh, famous for the Meyer Rubber Works. Again, uh, it was one of the first customers on the line and they had a big extensive operation. They had been there for dozens of years uh, at this point, decades probably. Um, and they were a large industry with hundreds and hundreds of employees. Um, Colthow was also one of the first customers in Milltown. He actually had the first switch put in uh, before the trains even ran, and he owned a grain, uh, a coal grain lumber all-purpose yard. Uh, and the basically, this is Washington Ave. Further up on the right would have been the stations, uh, and the tracks would have been up there. One of the interesting things to see from 1893 is a report that went national all across the United States that the messenger, that the Milltown passenger station actually blew away in a storm uh, and landed on the tracks. So maybe there was a tornado or a hurricane or something, uh, but this made national news, uh, which was kind of interesting at the time. But the real issue for the new little railroad was that the trolley line was coming in 1895. In fact, the trolley was coming to all the towns that the Raritan River Railroad served. And the first smack in the face was that the trolley company managed to secure the rights to use the right of way that the Raritan River Railroad had secured, but never used when they were planning to go from New Brunswick to Boundbrook. So that was just the first uh, kick they would get. Now the, rar the railroad would fight back, right? And by convincing landowners near the trolley tracks to raise the issue that the tracks under the proposed plan and curving from George Street, for example, would pass too close to the curb and the value of their land would be depreciated. The courts would then have to settle this and they sometimes they would halt construction and review the ordinances being used by the construction company. This was nothing more than a stalling tactic, but they did it repeatedly. The, Raritan, uh, the railroad also had another trick up their sleeve though, as they built what I call a spite station at Tanner's Corner. So to try to steal some of the customers away from the trolley because you see the trolley was gonna be right past right behind where the camera was on this main street bridge. So they decided, the railroad decided to build a small stop here on the Western side of South River, if only to try to get a few more customers uh, for their own. In the end, this Tanner stop only, sir, only lasted about six years and it got abandoned when the trolley finally got finished to South Amboy as it probably just didn't get any traffic at all. Um, I don't have any statistics here, but I can tell you that the passenger revenues dropped by 25% when the trolley line started, and it dropped by 50% when the trolley line got finished into South Amboy. So it was a pretty big blow for the Raritan. They didn't make a lot of money on passengers, but I don't think they wanted to give up half their revenue either. But the Raritan River, the railroad would try, right? The, uh, the railroad attended all the town meetings where all the trolley line uh, meetings were uh, going to be held with the town councils where they had to get approval. In one case, the railroad suggested that the township insist that the trolley company be compelled to pave the roads with macadam 20 feet wide and pave between the rails with Belgian blocks and light the roads with electricity. Now in South River, the railroad had stirred up some opposition to the electric railway by fostering the idea that some business would lose customers if their customers could take the trolley to New Brunswick. And who's to say that they were wrong? So the railroad continued to fight and to stall. In one case, the town council got smart and had the meeting on a Saturday at noon when all the courts would be closed, allowing the trolley company and the, re the rest of the weekend to lay all the rails they could before the official objection could be filed by the Raritan River Railroad on Monday. Um, the Raritan River River wasn't completely out of line though in their objections, as in some of the meetings, the members of the boards of some of these towns agreed that the electric railway should be completing and maybe doing things a little better. Um, in one case with South River, they said that they should be compelled to pave the bridge with asphalt and widen it by adding a balcony sidewalk. So they said the trolley would take up 11 feet of the roadway, uh, not leaving much room for anyone or anything else that might be on the bridge, which was only 16 feet wide. So they really did have a valid point. If you were on that bridge with a cart or a horse or an ox that wasn't gonna move very fast, and here comes the trolley, it, 10 miles an hour, your ox isn't going to move. So they, they kind of had a valid point. Um, at one meeting in South River, John Whitehead made a stirring reply, declaring that the South River, that South River is perfectly able to look after its own interests without any assistance from the Raritan River Railroad or South Amboy. 
And he said, I quote, we don't want the people of South Amboy coming up here and putting sauce on our pudding, he exclaims. Then he paid his respects to the Raritan River Railroad, in which he was actually a large customer at the time. At this point, they probably had four or five sidings uh, for Whiteheads. Um, so he was a fairly large sand and uh, brick uh, customer. Um, so uh, he paid his respects to the Raritan River Railroad, um, maybe in the same way you reprimand a child and then you tell them that you love them, right? Herman also spoke up of Herman and Aukman, the handkerchief factory, and he spoke in favor of the trolley line and said flat out that he sees it as being a more convenient way for his workers to get to work. So it was always going to be an uphill battle. But rumors would get published, as they always did, like this one that says the trolley line was going to buy the New Brunswick and Old Bridge Turnpike. But in the end, you just can't stop progress. And the trolley line was opened from New Brunswick to South River on November 2nd with 14 trolley cars running and on opening day. The trolley cars ran from their George Street Depot, which was just 100 feet from the Raritan River Railroad's New Brunswick station, to Milltown and to South River. And it was only 100 feet away from the Milltown, from the New Brunswick station, because they didn't have the right to cross the tracks yet. So they basically built the, the trolley line right up to the station. <laughs> um, so they, uh, uh, they had cars that were leaving every 15 minutes. Uh, in, in the future, they would leave every half hour. But the trolley is much slower than the trains, right? The trolley took 45 minutes to go from New Brunswick to South River. Now, the Raritan River Railroad only took 16 minutes to go from New Brunswick to South River, but the trolley would leave every 30 minutes, where the trains would leave every two or four hours. So shortly after trolley service opened to South River, a serious wreck occurred November 7, 1895, when a Raritan River Railroad passenger train didn't see an open drawbridge in South River due to the fog. The train tried to stop. The crew jumped off the train as the engine slid through the open drawbridge and landed face down in the river. Amazingly, the tender stayed on the bridge as well as the passenger cars. The engineer, Fred Bissett, tried to stop the train, but once it became apparent it wasn't going to stop, the whole crew, all the crew jumped. The brakeman jumped and landed on the embankment and rolled down and got covered in mud, but he escaped without injury. The engineer was not so lucky. He jumped uh, and broke his leg when he landed in a, a, a boat that was moored to the side of the bridge. Um, James Welsh, another brakeman, jumped into the water and managed to swim ashore. Frank Hoffman was the superintendent of the Railroad River Railroad, and he was also on the train, but he wasn't crazy. He didn't jump off. Richard Sullivan, the conductor, and just remember that name, Richard Sullivan, uh, he also jumped into the water, but he was weighed down by his clothes, and the tide and the current was starting to pull him out uh, and proceeded to pull him further out into the channel where he was rescued by a rowboat. Keep uh, Richard's name in mind, you will hear from him again. Unfortunately, the Raritan River Railroad, since there was no active trains on the western side of the bridge, the only way to get to New Brunswick from South, to South River was by the recently deployed trolley cars. Like literally November 2nd is when the trolleys opened and November 7th is when this wreck happened. So rumors now that the B&O was gonna buy the Raritan River Railroad and this started when someone started buying properties along the Raritan Bay next to the Raritan River. Um, there was lots of rumors about people going to buy the Raritan River Railroad. And that was ultimately because the people who built the railroad wanted to sell out. They, as I said, they wanted to connect with the CNJ. They wanted to get leased. They weren't in the, they didn't, the officers didn't want to be in the railroad operating business. Um, it would take a couple of years before that next phase of management would come in. Another rumor was started in 1896 when a P Pennsylvania Railroad engine and private car was seen on the Raritan River Railroad and made an inspection trip. In 1896, a horrifying but hilarious incident occurred when two men beat up another man unconscious and laid him on the railroad tracks to get run over. But they did this on the Sayreville branch, which, unknown to them, only ran two trains per day. And yes, this was over a girl. So here we are in the late 1890s in New Brunswick. We see a number of improvements that have been added to the commercial lab location. We note a passenger depot, a turntable, a freight house, almost two acres of property with 680 feet of sidings. Um, a new 10 ton crane is in the yard and a new loading platform is built on the main line to the new musical string factory on George's Road. Across from the depot, we see another early customer, the New Brunswick Coal and Ice Company. Now, 
I, this is a very crude map. I do apologize. Maybe someday somebody can help me make a better one. I don't have any maps of what the commercial lab depot looked like. Obviously, it was here for almost 10 years. We know that they had passenger depot, freight stations. Uh, the trolley line would have come right up to it at the very top on Commercial Ave. Um, they had a turntable. Um, here we, we know why kids should not play on railroad turntables, for it's all fun and games spinning around until your foot gets caught and your heel gets cut off at the Raritan River Railroad Turntable in New Brunswick, right? A big fire breaks out in 1896 in New Brunswick at the New Brunswick Coal and Ice Company that we just talked about right across the tracks from the Raritan River Railroad Depot. See, the wind was blowing in the opposite direction of the trestle, so the long coal trestle did not catch fire, but there were 20 rail cars full of coal on a side track running along the Raritan River Railroad Station. Five of them actually did catch fire and were nearly totally destroyed. So this was a pretty big blaze. In 1897, the Meyer Rubber Works in Milltown would shut down. Now, this was a really serious blow to the town as the factory employed 500 people. Now, the thing here is Milltown as of only had 561 residents as of the year 1900. So as you can imagine, most of them, more than half of them probably worked in the Meyer Rubber Works. Um, so that was probably a pretty significant blow to the town. But as one door closes, another one opens, especially at this time of history. As in 1897, the musical string factory opens up in North Brunswick. Again, just a quick train ride or a slower trolley ride away from Milltown. This factory had a strange loading platform that extended from the factory to the main line, um, allowing boxcars to be left on the main track to be quickly unloaded between the four daily trains going into New Brunswick. So that must have been interesting when you think about having uh, to get something unloaded extremely quickly. Uh, they did have a siding here on the left, but that was mostly for the coal trestle. So a uh, big fire in South River in 1897. The office was struck by lightning at Clayton Lumber uh, at 10 p.m. So first the horses were rescued. Mr. Clayton shows up shortly after the fire starts um, and he busts through the window of his office and made a daring rescue of his desk and all his papers. Now a valiant effort was made to move the carload of lumber that was in the yard by attaching a rope and pulling the car from the line. Some 50 or more men, many were just bystanders who came to watch the fire, started to pull the car from the fire. But the ties were already damaged by the fire and the rail spread apart and the car just jumped the track. Later, nothing but the trucks and the ironwork remained of that car. Now Clayton stayed around for a while. He planned to rebuild. He had three or four cars of lumber already on the way. And apparently he just ordered seven more cars the next day to restock his yard. The oddest story I found so far in the 1890s was that a man had got hit by a train because he was collecting eggs from between the rails. Um, I don't know why there would be eggs between the tracks. Um, if he dropped them, you would have expected they would have broken. Um, maybe there's a certain type of chicken that likes to live under the under the tracks. I don't know. Here we see the International Smokeless and Powder and Dynamite Company building a plant along the line in Saraville in 1899. They wanted to make smokeless powder and dynamite, but wanted to use corn pith instead of cotton. So corn pith comes from the waste of corn stalks, and it's much cheaper than cotton, which was in high demand and expensive because you use cotton for clothing. So while the corn pith worked in making smokeless powder, it didn't work good enough that the government wanted to buy any. So they eventually redesigned the plant a few times, eventually getting a formula and a system that worked. As a reward, Henry Fletcher Brown, who created the working formula, got the privilege of naming the new post office and the Raritan River Railroad Station stop. You see, up to this point, the stop was listed as Powder Works. There was not a name for this area or this town of Sayreville. He named the post office there Parlin in honor of his maternal grandmother, Safrana Parlin. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is how the town of Parlin got its name. Now, eventually, this plant would become so successful that DuPont would buy it out. Uh, and then, as they say, the rest is history. A serious wreck occurred in 1899 when the passenger train, um, uh, when, a, pa when a, a serious wreck occurred in 1899 when a passenger train jumped the tracks at the switch for the PRR connection uh, near Melfort, which is that such as uh, connection that went to the PRR. The engine left the tracks and plunged down the embankment, followed by two cars. 
engineer C.W. Mulford and fireman John Sullivan, maybe Richard Sullivan's brother, both jumped from the train before it went over. The engine was badly damaged. One of the passenger cars caught on the tender and was prevented from overturning. Conductor Richard Sullivan, there he is, was the first man out of the train, and though badly hurt, he went to work assisting in rescuing the passengers. The most seriously injured passenger had a broken ankle. Other, another was thrown over three seats in the first car and received a sprained shoulder, but nearly everyone was cut or bruised in some manner. Now, as I wrote this summary, I, I had thought that I had seen an image before of a passenger car resting on a tender somewhere, right, in my hundreds or thousands of pictures. And then I realized it. Fred Debert, when he wrote Rails Up the Raritan, had this exact picture in the book uh, from the official company files of the Raritan River Railroad, which unfortunately are all lost today. So I went and double checked the newspaper article and compared it to the unknown wreck. And I believe we have a match. I think we can safely say that this picture is from the 1899 wreck at Melfort. This was actually the second time that I made a description match a picture in Fred's book when uh, he had a picture of an unknown, uh, unknown location for a wreck. By 1899, the new rubber company plans to build a factory in Milltown and they're gonna call themselves the India Rubber Company. But the real news for 1899 is that the Raritan River Railroad is buying large chunks of property in New Brunswick and plans to build a large terminal complex. The new stations will be opened in 1900 and will change the area for the next 85 years. Here we see an early shot of the passenger depot at the freight station, noting that the freight station is only two bays wide. Interestingly, we see some horse and buggies between the stations, but as I played with the contrast on this picture, I could see not just the station agent in the doorway, but now we see a little girl appear from the shadows on the left, who I assume was his daughter. <clears throat> it's amazing sometimes the things you can pull out of an old photo. So here, this is a timetable from the early 1900s. Um, it shows the uh, powder mills as a stop. Uh, it shows Tanner's Corner as a stop or just Tanner's. Um, uh, it still shows the Roberts and Melfort stops. Uh, they would disappear uh, in the teens. Um, oh, this is an interesting story too. So this is the, the one of the stranger situations where um, um, a trolley car was put on a Raritan River Railroad flat car and brought to South Amboy because the trolley line was still having problems getting finished in South Amboy. So if you remember 1895, they went from New Brunswick to South River. Well, it took them five years to go from South River to South Amboy and they're still not finished. Apparently there was a bunch of bridges that needed to be strengthened or rebuilt in South Amboy. So what they wanted to do was build the trolley tracks right up to the bridge on both sides and just have a trolley meet the people. So they walk from one trolley across the bridge to the other but they needed the Raritan River Railroad to bring that trolley car to the other side of the tracks, which I thought was just kind of uh, funny. More news for 1900 includes the building of the service branch from, the East, from East Brunswick down and around back into South River. Um, you can see again, more properties, more sand and clay companies. You've got Edgar, National Pyrogranite, um, Petit and Company. Um, all of these companies had property. Uh, some of them had brickyards uh, along the river. Uh, which were just ideal for this type of uh, manufacturing. Uh, we note that a few of the properties along this line had to be condemned. Uh, the property that was right up against uh, Old Bridge Turnpike and, and eventually Route 18, um, uh, Henderson's had to be condemned and there was a big chunk uh, in the middle uh, uh, getting closer back to South River. Um, these properties would revert back to their original owners when the line was abandoned in the mid 50s, which caused a lot of grief to the Raritan River uh, as they wanted to sell all this property. Key industries on the service branch would be Whiteheads, which had a number of sidings, National Pyrogranite, which uh, had a big siding down here. They, they made basically a fake type of granite brick. Um, may or may not have worked real well. Uh, they weren't in business for very long. It seems like they were constantly bankrupt. Um, Lyle's siding, which surprisingly shows a uh, Raritan River Railroad water tank up here. 
Um, but this actually looks like it's shared with the narrow gauge line that came through and actually went under the Raritan River Railroad. Uh, I, I don't have any official documentation on a shared water tank, but it's just an interesting concept. We see the lignum siding next to another narrow gauge line from National Pyrogranite. A lignum made um, uh, fireproof doors. Um, uh, and uh, they made fireproof uh, uh, blocks and, and things of that nature. Um, but the bigger surprise was to see a Lyles station listed with a long 550 foot freight house siding. Uh, Lyle Station was, again, just like the Sayreville Station that would have been built, uh, was built on somebody else's property, uh, owned and managed by somebody else, but the railroad got to use it. Uh, the two, so here we see a wreck uh, in 1901 where two engines collided, uh, both of them, uh, again, at the New York and Long Branch connection. Uh, they tied up the line. Uh, for a couple hours. Uh, apparently, Raritan River Railroad trains weren't running until noon, but at least no employees were uh, injured. Another Pennsylvania Railroad train with special observation car full of potential investors, but this time there were CNJ, CNJ people on board also. So again, we're going to go into the early 1900s and we're going to realize that uh, there was clearly a lot of interest, a lot of talk, these could have been sponsored by the Raritan River Railroad themselves to try to entice investors to uh, buy out the line. Uh, a year later, another CNJ engine with a private car was seen on the line. So clearly, as I said, there's no secret that the Raritan River Railroad wanted to be sold. Uh, but lucky for us, this never actually happened. A big fire started by a Raritan River Railroad locomotive. There were actually a lot of these, uh, but this is the biggest one because this one consumed about 50 acres um, in the woods between Milltown and South River, which basically means East Brunswick. And 50 acres is a lot of property when you think about it. And of course, the Raritan River Railroad would then get sued. They would have to pay for all the lumber that got burnt up. And the people sometimes would say that their property was worth more and so on and so on. So again, this time it's the B&O who uh, again, uh, did not buy the Raritan River, highlighting the desire to get to Tidewater and South Amboy where the Raritan River uh, and, and they would build a large terminal facility for coal and stuff. So as I said before, the goal was to always get to Bound Brook, get coal going east, the coal routes going from Pennsylvania to New York, um, it was an insatiable demand. They just couldn't get enough coal up there. And by this point, by the 1870s, 1880s, eight, clearly 1890s, these lines are getting congested. They're getting busy. And so the whole goal was to get them into Tidewater. Raverton Bay was a great opportunity for that. Um, and then you could get them on a barge and get to New York or the surrounding areas. Uh, in this case, Howell Lumber is going to move into the New Brunswick Yard, 1900. In Milltown, the Russell Playing Card Company moves into the building uh, that the India Rubber Company built recently, but just vacated. Um, here we see a Sanborn fire map showing the Russell Card Company with two sidings below that we see the trolley barn and the powerhouse. Uh, there was also, these were also Raritan River Railroad customers. So, uh, the trolley, the powerhouse would get coal. Uh, they had some odd turntable combination here early on. I'm not sure exactly how that worked. Somehow they would have to shunt the coal cars and maybe an engine onto the turntable, spin it and get it into the, the back of the powerhouse. Um, the mail town stations would be to the upper, uh, just past this, uh, uh, just past the Russell card company uh, on, Wash on Washington Ave. This is the area near the main line that we're talking about as far as Milltown is concerned. This is a great shot of the former India Rubber Company, now the Russell Card Company building, showing their coal trestle in the front, I guess on the side. Uh, the siding that ran to the trolley barn and the powerhouse, as well as a line to Michelin, uh, probably. Uh, in the upper left is Colt Owls Coal and Grain Yards. In the back right, we see the only picture of the first Milltown passenger and freight station uh, back here. So uh, I am eternally grateful for this picture or this postcard or whatever it is, because um, I don't have any pictures of uh, the first Milltown stations. Here we see Squibb. Uh, a chemical producer, uh, again, I think later years they get into pharmaceuticals, uh, they build a large plant starting in 1905 and would be one of the last early customers still on the line in 1980. 
this was due uh, it was due to these long lasting customers that lasted 75 years or more that kept the Raritan River Railroad afloat and profitable in the future. When you think about it, companies like DuPont and Hercules that started uh, in the early 1900s or into the teens, uh, some of them are still on the line today, actually. Um, Hercules, the name changed, and I think DuPont is still there, but they're not receiving freight. Um, this is, uh, uh, oh, starting in 1905, right? So the South River branch now gets constructed south from South River. Uh, if you recall, the up until 1901, 1902, the Sayreville branch was getting extended. Now they extend the branch line a little bit further down along the river. Here's an aerial view of South River showing the American Enameled Brick and Tile Company in the center, passenger and freight station on the left side up against the Herman Handkerchief Factory, South River Swing Bridge at the top crossing the river. Note that the South River branch that snakes from a separate crossing on Washington Ave, then scoots around the right side of the factory and then basically curves around and goes uh, down the south of the river. Uh, they actually took the, uh, the, this company here to court because this company had a little tramway, a little narrow gauge where they could run their trams and stuff to the river for loading on the docks, uh, and they didn't have permission from the Raritan River Railroad. Now, this factory was built in 1894. The South River branch was built in 1905, 1906. Unfortunately, this factory would burn down in 1934 and would never get rebuilt. Let's talk about the South River branch for a second, right? As further down the line we go, we can see the brickyards and sand and clay pits of Wrights and Bissets, as well as the South River Waterworks, uh, which was getting regular coal deliveries by this point. So for the first seven years, right, starting the line in, in the, the line started running on its own in 1892. The Raritan River Railroad had three injury engines operating on the line. So this continued for seven years until 1899. This is when the line received engine number four, you know, coincidentally as traffic and loads were increasing into New Brunswick, probably again, due to the new terminal facilities that they built up there. In 1900, engine number five shows up just as the service branch is being expanded through East Brunswick back into South River to serve the many sand and clay and brick, fire brick yards that are part of that uh, part of the river. Uh, engine number six shows up in 1905, again, just as the South River branch um, is being uh, completed to serve yet another set of sand and clay uh, and brick companies. So the first seven years, three engines, no significant expansion, steady tonnage and growth. But then the next seven years, the line literally doubles in size from three to six engines. Um, as things get busier, things get riskier and accidents begin to happen more so. In South Amboy, which was very crowded at this point, being pressed up the, you know, the Raritan River Railroad line was being pressed up right against the New York and Long Branch lines, and there wasn't a lot of space. There was a big curve, steep grade. It was not ideal for shifting and sorting of freight cars. They didn't have a very big yard in South Amboy either. So if trains, uh, if trains crashing into trains wasn't enough, how about a train crashing into a house? Yes, in 1906, the Raritan River Railroad crashed into a house in New Brunswick. So exactly how does that happen? Well, a passenger train with two passengers on board enters New Brunswick. One of them was the wife of the ticket agent in New Brunswick. Typical operation in 1906 was to swing the three passenger cars into the siding with a quote unquote flying switch maneuver. Simply said, the engine pulls the cars, breaks off the train, pulls ahead, the switch gets thrown, allowing only the passenger cars to roll by themselves to the depot. Conductor Richard Sullivan worked the brakes manually on the passenger cars as they entered the dead end siding, but the brakes did not work. The passenger cars broke through the end of the track, crossed over the street, dashed up a slight incline, tore down a fence, and crashed into the porch, doing significant damage to the house. And uh, you can all see the house at the very end of this car across uh, from Sanford Street. But in this case, the Raritan River uh, did very well by Mr. Mount, the owner of the house. And after a quick trip to Jersey City, they gave him a large check equivalent to the price of a new house. So in 1907, another chemical company was now moving to the New Brunswick or North Brunswick area. Here's a map showing the many different companies that would open up along the Raritan River in this area, you know, basically behind the musical string factory and across from Squibb. 
So this area was getting filled up pretty quickly uh, with lots of industries. By 1907, Michelin Tire has moved in and is now asking for a spur line directly into their large factory complex in Milltown. Here we are in the mid to late 1900s, showing many of the larger companies now on the line. Too many to list, right? Smaller ones all around. There were team tracks at almost every railroad crossing. Uh, the Raverton River Railroad at this point was getting busier every year. And as I said before, the busier they got, the more accidents that happened. One of the worst happened in 1909 when superintendent of the Raritan River Railroad, Cyrus Spruill, was run down in South Amboy on the New York and Long Branch tracks when he was run down by a fast moving New York bound express. He was standing on the New York and Long Branch tracks, but due to the heavy steam escaping the Raritan River Railroad locomotive, he did not see the express coming down. The brakeman was standing on top of one of the cars and shouted to Spruill, but he didn't hear him. I won't go into detail of what happened to poor old Spruill. But when you get hit by an express train moving at maybe 60 miles an hour, uh, it's not pretty. So the 1910s were a crazy and unprecedented decade in the history of the Raritan River Railroad with increases in passengers and freight due to World War I. But at this point, I can only touch up on some of the fun things that took place on the line. Movies, movies, movies. In my research, I have cataloged over two dozen movies that were made on the Raritan River Railroad between 1910 and 1923. I know there were more, but much of the source materials are long lost to time. So here are some of the actor, actresses and actors who starred in these movies, in many cases side by side with the real employees of the Raritan River Railroad. In many cases, local town folk were actually used as extras. In one such movie, 50 children from Sayreville and South River were actually used in an amazing story of children stuck in a schoolhouse at risk from a giant forest fire where the hero comes through on a train through the flames to save them. That entire set was actually built on Such's property in Sayreville and burned down to the ground for the film. So here we are with just some of the movies that were made in the, on the Raritan River Railroad. Um, the Runaway uh, Engine uh, with Anita Stewart, uh, I'm sorry, Alice Joyce, uh, and we're going to watch that shortly. Um, the Lost Freight Car uh, was an interesting story where um, a, a car disappears from uh, the train and the conductor gets fired and then spends the rest of the movie trying to find it. The Engineer's Daughter, which was a romantic comedy where two people try to elope, but the father chases them in a train. <laughs> um, Wild Beasts at Large, all right? So basically this was a wild animal comedy where the animals go into the stores and the houses of a small town. But in this case, some of the animals actually did escape with some kangaroos actually making their way into Crossman's clay pits where they were eventually finally rescued. To date in 1913, the largest train wreck on film was recorded in Sayreville as two locomotives were run, uh, were a set a few miles apart and run into each other at full speed with cameramen all along the right of way to capture it. It was the most expensive crash ever filmed at the time, costing $35,000 back then, which would have been the equivalent of about a million dollars today. This wreck scene changed everything at the time. Some theaters played it, <clears throat> excuse me, every night for weeks, breaking all records. When it came to the local area, hundreds, if not thousands of people uh, showed up and the police actually had to be called for, clout, for crowd control. Again, one of the first documented times that this actually happened. Here we have a car that's getting wrecked by a train in Parlin. I don't know the movie name yet, but someday I will surely track it down. That said, I found this clip from 1913 in a movie from 1940 about stunt actors. Uh, so we're going to see this uh, crash scene too. You know, it's only eight seconds long, um, but you know, again, I'm grateful to have it because all most of these silent movies are are gone. There's a movie uh, filmed in Milltown called 413. Uh, 413, yes, a movie about diamond smuggling and secret agents, and apparently it was quite a story. The big reveal, which is made at the end of the movie. Uh, at the end of the crash, as they pull the body from the wreck and find the smuggler's chief was none other than Mr. Hall, which was Elaine's father, known as Agent 413. And that was the uh, big climatic moment at the end of the movie. In Rails Up the Raritan, we see the caboose number three was sold to Fox Films. This would have been uh, for the movie Checkers, where the caboose and a boxcar 
are set aflame and sent down into the river off of the South River Swing Bridge. Bye bye caboose number three. The Juggernaut was filmed in 1915, which we will see shortly, where the train goes off a trestle into Duck's Nest Pond in Sayreville. At this point, we're going to switch gears a bit and watch two silent movies that were made on the Raritan River Railroad. The first is uh, going to be the Runaway Engine. So just give me a second to set that up, please. So this movie was actually recorded in um, this movie was uh, uh, recorded in 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 all along the line from South Amboy all the way up uh, into South River. Um, it was uh, recorded. It was uh, uh, the the card screens were converted to German when this movie was uh, sent overseas into Europe. So let me. Uh... Okay, good, great. So this movie, right, is The Runaway Engine. It's from the Desmet collection in the Netherlands, actually. This collection consisted of more than 900 silent films, thousands of posters, photographs, and programs, as well as the archive of the business that ran the, by the theater owner and film distributor, Jean Desmet. Its main focus was on the period of 1907 to 1916, when Desmet worked as a traveling cinema operator and later as a cinema owner and distributor. So literally, this guy kept a copy of every film he showed, uh, which was amazing. And again, it was an amazing archive. Uh, in 1957, a year after his death, the collection came into the possession of the Dutch Film Museum. So the title cards are in German. Uh, I'm going to convert, I'm going to translate them into English for you. I can tell you that this is Alan. This is the son of the director of the railroad. Um, from the synopsis, I can tell you that he just got back from college and now he wants to work on the railroad with his father. It says that Alan learns from scratch. Basically, he's going to start at the bottom as a brakeman or a fireman, and then he's going to work his way up. So this is a great shot. This is South Amboy. That's the New York and Long Branch connection in the background. Uh, this is obviously pre-electrification. Obviously, this was So here it says, after two weeks, Alan met the driver, the engineer of the locomotive. So he's moving up. This is South River. That's the South River passenger station right there. It was remodeled in 1910. Uh, so it's pretty much brand new. Uh, and the freight station is in the back. The Herman, uh, the handkerchief factory is off to the left. And that's going to be South River Yard in the background. Now, there's a good chance that that's a real employee of the Raritan River Railroad. As I said, they use the employees to drive their own trains. So here, Alan meets Grace. And he is smitten. Of course, the engineer knows that they have a schedule to keep, so he's just going to leave and Alan will jump on the train. So here it says that Alan frees Grace from the vagrants who plague her. Apparently she's being bugged in the rail yard by a bunch of hobos. 
Um, I believe that um, somebody just texted me and said they can't see the video. Can you guys see the video? Uh, Tom, right now we're just seeing a sort of striped screen. Uh, okay, I thought we had this tested. So let me try and s let's see. So, so you can't see anything? We can see your, um, your PowerPoint and then the window in front of it is, is not visible right now. Okay. Um, well, let's go back and try this again. Uh, right away. So let me do a new share. Let me share. Screen one. Okay, so can you see, can you see the movie now? Yes. Okay. Do you want me to start it from the beginning? Probably. Okay, great. Okay. I'm going to start it from the beginning. I apologize for that. Technical difficulties. There okay. we go. Looks good now. All right, good. So the, the runaway locomotive, the title card is in German. Uh, so it says the son of the railway director wants to dedicate himself to the railway service. His name, this is the director of the railway. Um, and uh, his son, Alan, who just got out of college. comes to talk to his father and then he explains to his father that he wants to uh, work on the railroad and that he wants to uh, start at the bottom and work his way up. And here it says, uh, Alan uh, will learn, learns from scratch, right? So this is a great shot. This is that New York and Long Branch connection, uh, uh, pre-electrification, as I said, because obviously this was 1910. This is the long grade coming up into South, uh, into, uh, South Amboy uh, for the Raritan River Railroad. So here we see uh, her name is Grace in the movie. That is uh, Joyce. So here it says, after two weeks, Alan met the engineer of the locomotive. What he's really going to do is he's going to meet Grace. So I get this. I guess at this point, he's no longer a brakeman or a fireman. Maybe, uh, maybe now he made it, and he's uh, acting as engineer. Now, as I said before, that's probably a real Raritan River Railroad employee. Um, the film companies did not uh, bring in their own engineers. So, And here Alan is talking to Grace. The engineer is like, I got a schedule to keep. We got to go. And Alan is still talking to Grace.
This says that Alan uh, frees Grace from the vagrants who plague her. Apparently she is getting bothered by a bunch of hobos in the rail yard. I think Richie King said that this was uh, maybe on the Rowway Valley line. I need to uh, I need to document specifically where this is. This is definitely not Raritan River Railroad, though. And it says, after a while, Alan makes his declaration of love to Grace. So at this point, he sends a telegram to his father, Mr. Ruth Peter, Rudolph Peters, and he says, I intend to marry the daughter of Steve Martin, the engineer, and I ask for your consent. At this point, they get a reply back from Mr. Peters, who refuses his consent. Mr. Director is not happy that his son is going to marry a telegraph operator. And now he basically is gonna take the first train to go talk to Alan. Uh, again, New York and Long Branch connection, Raritan River on the right, the Raritan River yard in the back. Uh, you can see Raritan Bay back there on the upper left. Here we see the South Amboy shops area around Stevens Ave. Um, eventually the big roundhouse and, and other complex would be built uh, behind us, but in 1910, everything was uh, in front of us around the curve. So the thing I love about these actors too is that they, they over-exaggerate everything and, and they had to, right? Because there was no voice, there was no sound. And you can just see his emotion, right? You're not marrying that girl on my dead body. Absolutely not. And here it says, a locomotive accidentally starts moving without a driver, uh, without an engineer. That's the Bordentown Avenue Road in the back.
Another scene not on the Raritan River Railroad. Again, Richie, uh, I'm sure, knows that location. I think he said that was Railway Valley, that one, I'm sure. Here it says that the extra train with the director goes off and now drives straight towards the runaway locomotive. So this message comes in and it says director's train is on the main line to the east and has just passed the last station. She gets another message now. And it says runaway locomotive on the main line notify all stations. And then she puts two and two together and she realizes. And this says a bold deed. So as she's running around trying to find an engineer to drive the train, she decides that she's gonna just do it herself. That little depot in front of us, the little shack, I believe is Vanty Venter Station, or stop, really wasn't much. That would have been Journey's Mill Road that they just crossed over. I believe that to be the South River in the background. Repeated the same shot. We saw the little shack go past again. So here she jumps off the train. And the, uh, the uh, train is going to collide into the runaway train. And that saves the director who is basically behind her train. And it says the director's train is saved from the collision 
and the director changes his mind about grace. Now, this is the director's train. There's Alan, right? He jumps off like, oh, my God, what happened? And there's the father, Mr. Director. He's like, you did this. <laughs> and then, obviously, he changes his mind and now. They're going to be one big happy family. So that was the runaway locomotive. I'm going to now play uh, the juggernaut, or at least juggernaut, at least half of it. Um, we'll start in the middle to save some time here. Give me a second. Let's hit play. So with the juggernaut, most newspapers described this movie as one of the most tremendous, expensive, and sensational bits of action that was ever snapped by a motion picture camera, quote unquote, in referring to the wreck that formed the climax of this five reel movie. This was one of the first movies to be released directly to movie theaters uh, and not resold through a third party distributor, which was controlled by Edison's monopoly. I won't get into the detail of Edison's, uh, you know, movie monopoly but ultimately he controlled a lot of studios and you had to pay him a license to use his equipment and he had to pay a license to show his movies and um, eventually the industry kind of tried to bypass him it was one of the reasons a lot of them went to california besides the good weather so while this wasn't the first wreck of a train seen in a silent movie it was one of the first to look so real and you'll all see that uh, when it happens especially with the crash and the plunge off the bridge the scene that shows the actors in the water truly swimming for their lives, um, it would later be revealed that this was a bit too realistic as five actors actually uh, narrowly escaped drowning during the filming as they um, were getting uh, hypothermia in the 60 degree waters and one was actually cramping up and unable to swim, had to be rescued. Part of this actually made it into the production film. Film, if I say that properly. It's my North Jersey accent, sorry. Anita Stewart and Earl Williams were already established actors. And so their reputations only got better after this movie. Uh, this is uh, Parlin. The, yeah, that was Parlin. I don't know what town this was recorded in, these parts. The wreck cost almost $25,000, 1915, which was about $645,000 in 2020 dollars. The cinematography was revolutionary for the time. As Motography Magazine in 1915 reported that the juggernaut was one of the biggest sensations ever offered in pictures at the time. Photographed in such a way as to one make one feel that he is at one end of a high trestle. The spectator sees rushing towards him a passenger train. And building up to this point, there were suspense, close-ups, flashbacks, all being worked up to the point where a person attempts to figure out what is going to happen next as the train reaches the defective bridge. As a package, the movie was a total blockbuster. In many cases, the movie houses had to re-rent the film, film as public demand would not subside. Another interesting thing about the film was, that, was the fact that it was five reels or about an hour long. At the time, the Edison Trust forced films to be one to two reels, expecting that the public had no interest or attention span for movies longer than 10 or 20 minutes. The juggernaut broke that concept completely and then opened the door uh, to significantly longer movies. That is Raritan Bay. That is the New York and Long Branch trestle, I think, uh, that ran between Perth, Ambi Perth Amboy and South Amboy, the, uh, the original one. The juggernaut was shown not only all across the United States, but it also made its way to Scotland in early 1916. Now, this is actually significant um, because World War I had already started in 1914, and shipments of unnecessary things like movies were going to be very rare. And more importantly, with the torpedo sinking of the RMS Lusitania in May of 1915, pretty much that pretty much stopped all non-essential transatlantic traffic. 
So this just goes to show that somebody seriously risked their life carrying this movie into a war zone. The last thing I'll say is that this movie was one of the few movies at the time to ever be re-released, not just re-rented, but apparently this got re-released in theaters in 1920. And this was the revolutionary train scene. Now, the funny thing is that engine would stay at the bottom of that river, uh, the bottom of that pond. This was filmed in Duck's Nest Pond in Sayreville uh, until 1938, maybe 1939, uh, when they finally fished it out for its scrap value. Some of the wooden box, some of the wooden passenger cars were down there, too. But most of them had pretty much dissolved by that point. Maybe the trucks and the iron came back up. There's a Raritan River Railroad rowboat. So this is the end of the train scene. Uh, I'm going to uh, cancel it here in the spirit of keeping things moving forwards. As you can assume, she wakes up and they hug, and uh, that is the end of that movie. I wanted to show you one last clip that I recently discovered uh, a year ago. <clears throat> uh, now, this isn't much. It's only seven seconds, and I actually slowed it down so that it's a little easier to see because it's really choppy and jumpy. But this was a train wreck uh, in 1913 at the Parlin station. Um, the station can just barely be seen on the left here, in the left hand side here. Um, this film, uh, film was a part of a movie that was made by Warner Brothers in 1940. 
So they had a movie called Spills for Thrills, and it was about stunt actors. Uh, and in reading the description in 1940, they referenced the fact that it showed old clips of Parlin uh, and a silent movie that was made uh, in Parlin. So it took me a while to track that movie down. This was a 16 millimeter version. Uh, it's pretty bad. Uh, I know that there's much better copies. Uh, so if I can get a better copy of this, I'm always trying to hunt that down. Um, but this is the third, you know, um, uh, silent movie. I'm still trying to figure out what the movie was. Um, but apparently, as I said, Parlin and um, um, Parlin and um, excuse me just for a second. Let me get back to my PowerPoint. Here we are here. Okay, so uh, can somebody tell me if can you guys see my PowerPoint? Um, we can see your PowerPoint. Yeah, it's it's just okay. a free frame of the movie. Yes, right yes, now. yes. Yeah, I'll I'll move off that. Okay, great. <laughs> so good. so another couple of movies uh, before we wrap up our movie section. Uh, the South River Bridge was a part of a movie in 1923 called Loyal Lives, where uh, it was about postal workers. And uh, I think that uh, he jumps off the South River swing bridge. Uh, clear that swing bridge was a really popular uh, movie making uh, tool uh, for many, many movies. Um, I haven't added them all up yet, but uh, there's even another one right after this, because the last movie I could find is Johnny Hines um, from, again, 1923. Uh, it says right here with numerous scenes taken between New Brunswick and uh, 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 South Amboy on the Raritan River Railroad. Uh, this was a comedy where essentially he crashed into a passenger train and then he goes and he chases it. And uh, as if I recall, this, the, the actual stunt had the train not moving, but they film him moving, you know, him driving and then they take a freeze frame and they did a bunch of stuff. So I believe this is the Washington Street crossing. I believe that's the uh, uh, water tower, the the Parlin water tower uh, that shows up in so many railroad shots. Um, but also recently I re I found this uh, advertisement for Surefire Flint and look what it is. It is that South River Bridge again and you can tell by the little wooden uh, uh, guides here at the bottom to stop boats from bumping into the uh, bridge above it. Um, so one of the things that uh, I, I just wanted to say that, you know, there were two reasons that the re that the Raritan was uh, big on making these movies at the time. One was that they didn't run trains on Sunday, which meant that the rails were safe. They were free. The production companies could set up all day. Uh, and they basically had, you know, unlimited resources of whatever they wanted to do on the line. Uh, the other reason that I recently found out was the president of the railroad at that time, William uh, Bumstead, uh, he was president from 1907 to 1922, maybe 1923. Um, he owned a production facility in uh, Hudson Heights um, up in North Jersey somewhere. And in that he probably had connections in the industry which is why a lot of these movies uh, were made on the Raritan River. So we're going to take a little tour now we're going to show some of the stations and then I'll wrap up by going through some of the cabooses and stuff. Um, here we have just a newspaper article shot from the passenger station and offices uh, in on John Street uh, in 1933. Uh, this building hasn't changed. If you look at it today, it is essentially the same building. Uh, the ground floor has been boarded up for over a decade, I think. Um, I don't ever remember it not being boarded up. Um, looks like the upper floors are probably rented out. And this is the New York and Long Branch uh, main line today. Uh, this is Bergen Hill, uh, probably again in the mid 30s with some really antiquated speeder on the line. Uh, the Bergen Hill stop was again built. Uh, it, it was a stop in the 1890s, more of a, a shelter. Uh, it got this big station uh, during the World War I passenger rush where they were moving uh, 9,000 passengers a day. Um, this is the first Parlin station. Uh, again, we see the International Smokeless Powder and Chemical Company sign as it was uh, for the most part also their freight depot. Uh, the post office was in here too. Um, this station itself shows up in other movies, um, other clips. Uh, like I said, there's, there's, I can only calculate, uh, I can only locate 20 references to 24 of them, uh, but there's, there's probably significantly more. 
Um, this is the second Parlin station that was again built during the World War I passenger rush. Um, uh, again, this was a really, really busy place with all the munition plants and things that were going on uh, with, with Parlin, uh, with DuPont, with Hercules, with the, the Union Power uh, 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 plant, which was the one that was built by Gillespie, uh, different than the one that blew up in Morgan. Um, so this area was, was really, really busy at that time. Um, and this highlights a great shot of that, right? So this is the back of the Parlin station. It shows a passenger train with five or six cars on it at this point. Uh, and, and some of these trains were probably even longer than that um, to move all these passengers um, in and out. Uh, this is a second Parlin station with Boxcar 100, which was a boxcar that was rebuilt only for online usage. Uh, Here's a great station, uh, a great shot shows the Parlin station with a passenger train. This was the Metro Liners, the 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 um, um, the Pennsylvania Railroad or Penn Central was doing a publicity tour on these new cars that they were getting for their high speed Northeast corridor, and they made a trip up the Raritan River Railroad all the way to Milltown. Uh, the 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 they actually had passengers on them. Um, you know, I, I don't know what they paid for that tour, but they would officially be the last passengers on the Raritan River Railroad, and that was uh, 1969. Uh, again, this is a little clip of, of what the Van de Venter shelter would have looked like in 1910. Um, here we're entering South River now. Uh, this is a great shot of the bridge, the South River bridge, Swing Bridge. Uh, it hasn't changed in over 100 years. It was built around 1910. Uh, it, uh, it replaced uh, some type of a wooden structure. I don't have any pictures of that. Um, the uh, you can see the handkerchief factory in the on the back right. Um, here we've got a great shot from uh, probably the twenties of the uh, um, uh, the fur of the second South River passenger station. Um, there's a similar picture that shows up in Rails Up the Raritan, but I believe that picture doesn't have these phone wires on it. So uh, that picture is a little bit older than this one, although they look almost identical. Um, this is a great shot of the uh, freight station uh, that had this big concrete uh, you know, deck around it that actually extended into the uh, factory, the uh, handkerchief factory next door. Um, at this point, it was no longer making handkerchiefs, but the, uh, the building was rented out many times and it did have a siding uh, behind the freight station. Um, this is a shot I just recently discovered too. It was actually inversed, so it was uh, almost never properly identified. Once I flipped it, uh, it actually looks right. I believe this to be again, late 30s, maybe even early 40s. Uh, passenger service ended on the line in 38, but the passenger station stuck around for a while. I think it was gone by 47, so it's hard to say when they exactly tore it down. Um, but you can see the yard and, and you can see the South River branch crossing uh, the road as a separate crossing. Um, South River complained all the time to the Raritan River Railroad uh, about trains blocking the road. Uh, and it's easy to see why. Uh, the same thing in, in, in Parlin. Here's a great shot of Caboose number five in front of the station. Of course, you can't see the station, but it shows the, uh, the handkerchief factory in the background. Unfortunately, the South River Fire of 1968, uh, now the passenger station was long gone, as I said, since the 40s, but the freight station would burn down. It was being leased out and the uh, handkerchief factory, a big chunk of it would burn down. Here we see the Milltown passenger station in the 1930s. Again, um, it was the passenger station, it was on the ground. Uh, in at the end of freight, at the end of passenger service, 1938, by 1939, they would move it, uh, you know, 100 feet further down the line, raise it up to the height of a boxcar, put a nice little platform around it, uh, and they call it the freight station. Um, uh, I, I, we can thank Lou Lucy Luzu for the uh, photographs here. I'm pretty sure he took them uh, right before he deployed to Vietnam, or I think that's my story uh, in, in 1971. Um, this is a picture in the later 70s. Uh, the window is boarded up. By this point, they're probably not really using the station much anymore. Um, here the station sits today. Uh, we're trying to get it moved across the street. 
Uh, we need help with fundraising and working with Middlesex County and navigating the issues uh, in getting this moved. So if somebody on the call thinks that they can help us, if they can help us move it, restore it, or even just help point us in the right direction, uh, we would love to hear from you. So contact your friends at Tri-State or contact us at the RRRRHS at gmail.com. This is a picture of the new Brunswick uh, passenger station, which again, got you know reformatted into a freight station in uh, after 1938. Here we see the uh, freight station, and this is a great shot because if you recall in the beginning when it was built in 1900, it was only two bays. Uh, here we see an extension now of uh, three or four bays that were added onto it. The New Brunswick yard would continue to get leased out and rented out over the years. Uh, this is a shot from 1966. It's a panoramic shot. I discovered that when I was going through uh, a collection of slides and I put them all together. Um, and again, it's just great. It shows the yard. It shows the passenger station, the freight station. It shows the dilapidated condition of everything. By the 60s, things were really starting to fall apart. Um, so here, let's talk a little bit about cabooses, right? This will help end our presentation with, uh, with tri-states, right? So this is caboose, uh, I believe caboose number one and engine number 10 in South Amboy. And I think this is dated to 1933. Um, caboose number two uh, would show up. Well, let's let's back up for a second, right? They had four of these little bobber cabooses, one through four, and they were purchased from the Lackawanna Railroad in 1916. Again, right in the middle of that World War One pass, uh, World War One rush. Um, number four was destroyed by fire in 1918. Number three was sold to Fox Films and burned and tossed in the river in 1919, and we saw that, leaving number one and two, uh, which would get scrapped in 1936. Now, this actually left a gap of a year before the next caboose shows up. Number five shows up, five and six both show up in 1937, again from the Lackawanna Railroad. Uh, number five would end its career like number three by taking a plunge into the South River when it rolled all the way down from Parlin in 1968. Eventually, they just threw it on the embankment and burned it down and carried away the scrap metal. Number six would survive, right, until the end. It would eventually get sold by Conrail uh, in 1980. Uh, unfortunately, it's no longer with us today. It did burn up on the uh, up town in Grafton, Grafton and Uptown, something like that. Um, uh, and in 1994, here is number seven. This would show up from the Lackawanna Railroad in 1951, right? So this is the first number seven. Um, it would never get painted red as it would get traded with the Pine Creek Railroad for a different caboose in 1965. The second number seven shows up in 65 from the Pine Creek, but technically this is a Vermont railway. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. It would get painted red. It would survive until the end of con uh, to the end of the railroad in 1980, um, but its final disposition has never been determined by me. So uh, I don't know where this guy went. Happily, the first number seven still sits in the Pine Creek Railroad yard, but without any trucks or wheels at this time. Caboose number eight would show up from the Lackawanna Railroad in 1954. And with his arrival, all the existing cabooses seemed to get a new coat of yellow paint. Eventually number eight would get painted red, but due to a small accident, it would lose its coupler. Management decides not to repair it, but instead to enhance the caboose by adding a small observation platform on the backside. And number eight is now used for inspection tours, which I assume were frequent due to the pending Conrail merger issues. Um, number eight would also survive until the end and would get sold by Conrail. I found this uh, caboose in Ivyland, PA, looking a lot worse for the wear um, back in 2004. It, it's looking pretty bad, but it was uh, slowly being repaired by its owner. Uh, it still exists today, but I believe that it is uh, in, in very, very bad shape. Of course, number nine and number 10 would both show up in 1969 from the Penn Central being ex New Haven cabooses. And number nine and number 10 would survive until the end, both getting absorbed into Conrail. Uh, at some point painted Conrail blue with some numbers, uh, 19795, 19796. Number 10 would be rescued by Tri-State Historical Society and is now in the process of being restored. 
So this is the end of the line. This is a great shot from the mid thirties. Uh, I believe it was um, uh, a Howard Johnson shot. And this is the end of the line and this is the end of the presentation. So if you have questions or comments, uh, you can feel free to email me at rrrhs at gmail.com. And uh, if you can help us save the freight, the station in Milltown, please email us too. Thank you. And uh, I hope to talk to you again. Thank you very much, Tom. That was excellent. Thank you. Um, yes, Tom. Thank, thank you very much. That was, that was very informative and excellent. Yeah. Maybe I told some things that people didn't know before, you know. As, uh, as um, about um, on the Lackawanna cabooses, I did a lot of research on them. The uh, one of the former employees told me that was also a weed sprayer. Yep, yep, I heard that too. That they 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 may have taken it out and and sprayed the weeds with it. Yep. Yeah, uh, one guy, Stu Miller, remembers the incident. He said they uh, pulled a coupler out by the roots. They were pulling a train with it, and uh, and the whole draft gear came right out and just laid there on the in the gauge. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's amazing that they didn't scrap it too, right? So, but I think that they uh, they were going to use it like for the inspection stuff too, because I do have a photo with the a CNJ guy on it, and I know when Conrail came in, Conrail was repeatedly uh, inventorying everything that they had, scanning the line. I know that they had a speeder trip a couple times, uh, assessing the line. So, um, I uh, yeah. I actually just brought, um, as is often the case, we're we're joined by some very influential people in the uh, in the eyes of history. Uh, Bill Shepard, who had worked through the EL and Conrail, and then continued as a, a consultant in the industry, is uh, is with us tonight. I, I just brought him on the panel. Bill, are you there? Yes, I am. Outstanding. So, um, uh, Tom, Bill had been involved back in in 1980 um, working with Conrail. Uh, in, in compiling the uh, report and, and actually one of the, uh, the really good questions that I, I was saving here till the end um, has to do with exactly this. Uh, you know, Tom, you had mentioned that uh, the Raritan River fought off Conrail for four years. Um, and I was hoping maybe Bill could add some, some perspective from, from the industry side about um, maybe what the, what the motives were, right? Did, did Conrail want to include the Raritan River or not? Why did Raritan River want to opt out and, and just sort of what was going on at that time? I'm not uh, familiar with uh, you know the back and forth on this. I was on the Atlantic region at the time and put together a consolidation plan to uh, for uh, Conrail to take over the operations of the Raritan River Railroad. And uh, so uh, that plan was done in February of 1980 and then was revised uh, in that in the month later. And uh, uh, there were some things that uh, were uh, later uh, happened, uh, such as uh, a new track connection was put into Brown's Yard, uh, which was the, uh, the new base of operations from there. But uh, initially, uh, the interchange uh, took place at Sambo or South Amboy, uh, and uh, the traffic was fed from Oak Island. And then after the uh, consolidation uh, in the, got done, uh, Morrisville uh, was the uh, yard, serving yard, uh, feeding uh, Browns, and then Browns, the, all the crews came out of there. Yeah, I, I, I do have um, a lot of information on what was going on in the 70s uh, with, with the Raritan River Railroad. And while I can never, uh, I don't have any official documentation from Conrail, I have a lot of information from the side of the Raritan River Railroad. Um, I don't want to spoil the secret, but I have a hunch on why it took so long for them to get absorbed. I do know that they were in the first draft of the final system plan, which came out in 1973. I also know that some of the branch lines were missing from that final system plan. And that then caused a panic. Um, and it was a tool that the Raritan River Railroad used because they basically told all the customers on the line, when Conrail takes over, you're not gonna get serviced because it's not in their final plan. And they sent all these letters off and they sent all these letters off to even Washington DC saying, you know, they should be left out of Conrail. The, the companies, you know, the industries want them to be left alone. They do a great job. Um, 
but in the end, I think that um, it was a stock issue. Um, the Conrail in absorbing the Central and absorbing the Pennsylvania did not own all the stock of the Raritan River Railroad. They were still an independent company with a separate board of directors. Um, I'm not going to tell you who owned all the stock. I, I, I'll reveal it in my next meeting if I get a chance. Um, but it was uh, somebody who was on the line for a really long time, a family uh, who helped operate the line. And I believe that they eventually got paid off. And once they got paid off, then Conrail wrote it off as a management transfer. It wasn't even a merger. It was a change of management. That's what they wrote uh, in the official uh, journals. And that's when then the assimilation, you know, the, the migration plan uh, was implemented. I, they, I, had, I had talked to some who said that it was just an out and out purchase. They just, their Conrail bought it because it wanted, it wanted to cut Red River out of the, out of the rate division. So it would get the entire haul, not the right, percentage. Right, sure. Yeah. And right, no, yeah. absolutely. And like I said, they probably owned, I, I don't know what percentage, because I just don't have those statistics, but I know that all through the years, uh, the Central and the Pensy owned probably 90, 95% of the stock. Um, they were the, the primary owners uh, of, and, um, but I also believe again, at the end, like I said, that um, they were unable to just assimilate the Raritan because they didn't control the Raritan even when they got all the stock from the Pensy and the Central. And they probably wrote some pretty big checks to get those, those last couple of shares. Interesting. Uh, one other uh, question, Tom, what parts of the railroad are still on the ground and uh, of those, what is still operational? So the last time I checked on the western end, uh, Silver Line Windows, which is in North Brunswick, which gets renamed uh, Anderson Windows, right? So they were receiving plastics uh, at least twice a week, uh, maybe once a week. Um, and the next customer before that, I think, is in East Brunswick in the Highview Industrial Complex. They were also receiving plastics. Um, it's been a while since I've, I've uh, figured all this out. Um, when you cross back over into Sayreville, you've got the, the old the steel mill was there. They were receiving scrap iron and ingots and stuff. I believe they're still operating. I can't say for certain. Um, and there was another metal dealer in near Vandy Venters, um, but I don't know if they were getting traffic. Uh, Hercules in, in Parlin, uh, I believe they're still connected. Uh, they're one of those companies that you almost don't want to know what they're shipping. I mean, for the longest time, they were shipping like really dangerous chemicals. So you, you don't even want to know uh, what they've got going in and out of that plant. But now I think they've got a name like Green Tree or something. It's not Hercules anymore. And they were decommissioning that plant. But, you know, to my knowledge, the rails are still connected. Um, uh, but it's been a while since I've hiked the line to, to see what all the customers were. And, and uh, as, as, as Bill said, what they did is right off the bat, very quickly, they closed down the operation in South Amboy. Um, where there really weren't any customers and they disconnected that switch and everything was coming over from Brown's yard. Um, now there used to be a customer right there called Sunshine Biscuit. Um, and Sunshine Biscuit um, used to get its freight from the Raritan River. It was uh, hopper, uh, it was flour for their bakery operation. But apparently there was a connection still to that plant to the PRR tracks. So again, when Conrail came in, um, they didn't need to get new approval for the line across Bordentown Avenue. They just had to reactivate the siding into Sunshine Biscuit. And then they rebuilt all that as their main way into um, the old Raritan River. Oh, there's a brick company too. The right off of uh, Journey Mill Road. Brickside, brick, what do they call it? Side, riverside, Riverside Bricks or something like that. Um, and, and they again this was 10 20 this was 10 plus years ago they were getting bricks by rail inbound kind of ironic um but that's that's about all i know these days i just thank you i show that the mileage from uh south amboy to brunswick was 12.30 miles yeah oh. it was yep. go ahead sorry and, and then there was of course the gillespie running track which uh, went out to browns as well but uh 
12.3 miles. Yep. They, they had a, a lot of spurs, a lot of branches, more than you saw on other railroads. And I think, again, that was just the product of them being able and willing to do these things. You know, they, they, they had uh, um, miles and miles of branch lines. They actually relayed the service branch in the late 60s, and they called it the East Brunswick branch. And they had Wonder Bread at the end of that line, also getting flour in East Brunswick. This was in the uh, uh, the late 60s, early 70s. And they actually had uh, two guys, which was a retailer uh, as, a, as, a, as a, a customer at the very end of that line. But they had this crazy switchback that you had to move the train through uh, where you literally had to pull up right up to Wonder Bread and then back the train into this curve and then back down back into where two guys' uh, siding was. So so the, yeah, they 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 had some interesting operations uh, for for a long time. On the equipment side, I I have a list here of six locomotives, five cabooses, ninety seven box cars, one crane, uh, it was a brown hoist crane, an idler car to go with the crane, one covered hopper that was used for sand, three uh, trucks vehicles. Uh, one tamper and one motor car. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that motor car I think still exists. I think it's in Pine Creek, buried somewhere in a shed. I haven't. Yeah, haven't seen motor it. car number seven. Yeah, yeah. You know, I have a picture of that somewhere. Um, but yeah, no, they 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 had six EMD uh, switchers SW nine hundreds that they would pair up as needed. Um, I do have an interesting shot uh, of all five of them uh, on a train. Uh, basically pulling a really long freight but usually they'd put two or three in the front and two or three in the back and that's how they were getting all the freight up out of uh south amboy where they did their classification in the sayerville yard and there were 56 employees uh, back in 1980 on the Rat river there were uh sadly a, a bunch of them got laid off unfortunately that's how things go when you get assimilated uh, but a lot of the union men the engine men you know the the engineers and the brakemen i'm pretty sure a lot of them did get absorbed into conrail uh especially if they were union right. um, but all the office workers and stuff uh, i know got let go or uh, just a few uh, tidbits from our, our viewers here one a uh, person offered up that uh, Anderson sold silver line to ply gem windows, but that they're still accepting cars. Okay. Ply gem windows? Yeah. Ply gem is P L Y G E M. Yep. I'll have to look that up. That is the last customer on the, the Western side um, um, beyond uh, uh, East Brunswick, right? So my gut feeling is that when the windows company stops getting the, 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 the vinyl pellets in, um, uh, they're going to be hard pressed to keep that South River Swing Bridge open for one customer in East Brunswick. Uh, but we'll see. I also had somebody scout out the South River branch. Uh, apparently, the tracks are still there near Bissett's Pond. Uh, and that's an interesting story, too, because uh, as I understood, the, the Conrail required that the customers help support and pay for the reconditioning of the line. Um, but then when the line was abandoned, they never ripped up the ties or the tracks, which typically wasn't like Conrail because Conrail came in and cleaned everything up. So the South River branch is is one of the few places where for almost two miles, uh, there's still tracks in the woods, in the swamp. One, uh, one other question that uh, a lot of people might be interested in, um, the, the film clip that you showed of the uh, engine going off the trestle into the pond uh, was that actually on the Raritan River and it was the trestle rebuilt? Okay, so that was built strictly for the movie. Uh, that was, uh, uh, it was off of the Raritan River Railroad. It was Duck's Nest Pond, which was actually a station stop at the time, uh, a flag stop where people could, uh, it was a watering hole where people could swim for free. Um, it's a part of Bailey's Park today in Sayreville, I believe. Um, and so that was built strictly for the uh, movie. It was curved. It was, uh, they did special things so that it would collapse. Um, and I think they even had some dynamite attached to it to facilitate the, uh, the collapse of, of, of the trestle. Uh, so it wasn't a real trestle uh, in use uh, in normal operations. Excellent, thank you. 
All right. Um, I see there's still a couple of hands raised. Hang on one second. Mr. Harwood, can you hear me? One of the uh, the uh, issues about uh, serving the Raritan River was any uh, service south of the uh, Raritan River, th that drawbridge was limited to 263,000 pounds. And today the gold standard is 280,000 pounds. So uh, that was a, uh, you know, a factor that uh, constrained uh, the e economics of that territory. And I'm sure it would cost a- Which bridge was that, money. Bill? That's the bridge over the Raritan River. Uh, and uh, it's, you know, it's on the uh, former New York and Long Branch. Right, right. Okay. All right. So getting, so coming down from Oak Island to what was the, you know, the, the junction point for the Raritan River. So you're saying that that was originally, they, they allowed, what was it? Well, 268? They, you, you could not go to 286 which okay. is the gold standard for today. It was something less than that. I'd say it was 263. Sure. But uh, so that uh, was a constraint. That's one of the reasons that uh, service was shifted to, through Morrisville instead and avoided the bridge. Sure. But, uh, you know, uh, there's a, a new bridge going to be built there, and I would expect that that constraint will be lifted. Sure, sure. Well, I'm sure the South River Swing Bridge has even a less constraint, considering that it goes back to 1910, and I don't think they've done many upgrades to it. Yeah, yeah. so I, I, I don't know what that one was, but, uh, uh, but the, the, the chief constraint at the time was the uh, swing, it was the uh, Raritan River Bridge. Sure. And it applied to not just the Raritan River Railroad, it applied to any Conrail customers south of there. Mm-hmm. There's actually a clip on on Facebook. I'll um, I'll get it. Did we lose Michael? I'll see if we can get that up. There. Here we go. Um, Michael, you cut out. Oh, sorry. There's a um, there's actually a clip on Facebook of the South River bridge being operated by hand. Oh, okay, great. Uh, yes, it is a hand bridge. If we can share that, Mr. Harwood, I saw you had your hand raised. Did you have a question? Oh, no, that's okay. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, and Mr. Fielding, you had a hand raised. Question for Mr. Feeling. I guess not. Um, okay. All right. Well, uh, Mr. Shepard, thank you for for joining us. It's always nice to. Yeah. No. Thank you. Have the the voice of people who were there. You're welcome. And uh, Mike, you want yeah. to uh, wrap up? Very much. It was, a, it was a hell of a show. Thank you. Maybe you'll let me come back in the fall and I can finish part two. <laughs> it sounds like a plan. Yeah, it sounds good. It sounds good. We'd love to we'd love to see the rest. Sure. All right. And uh, by then, there are some changes happening on Conrail. We'll see how the Red River survives. You know how how it. Uh, you know you might you might see other railroads operating that after a while. Survives or maybe thrives. Well, it'll 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 survive. Um, I see the big railroads trying to uh, pair off some of the Conrail branch stuff. You know, the big railroads are trying to to re reduce the cost of running Conrail. You know, so you're gonna you're gonna see some track being built to avoid you know to to help in that. And uh, as far as the river goes, you know, th those would be obvious candidates to spin off. You know. The Sayerville Secondary is what they used to call it. I don't know if that's what they call it today. Yeah. Very good. All right, all. I'll, uh, I guess, Mike, if we have nothing further, we can uh, sign off from here. Thanks. Oh, yes. once again, thanks, everybody, for tuning in. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing everyone next month.
Thank you all well, once again. This was another uh, very, very well attended meeting. And, and Tom, thank you. There's a lot of great comments. Um, I'll get you the, uh, the transcript of the comments. There's some, some questions and some things you might want to follow up on. So Excellent. Bill, thank you. We'll get that over to you. Bill and contributing. That's, that's nice because you were there. You were, you were part of the process. You know? Absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, we'll uh, see everybody next month. Yep. Thank you very much. Everyone Thanks. stay. Bye-bye.